If you're shopping for a family vehicle with three rows of seats and towing ability 7,000 pounds or higher, you don't have too many options that won't break the bank. Really, the only option actually is the Dodge Durango. Now, not this Durango, because this one is the absolutely insane 710 horsepower Durango. That's why we have a little Hell Kitty right there on the front grill. I'm generally referring to the more rational 5.7 liter V8 or perhaps the 6.4 liter V8. Now, you may or may not know this, but I happen to own a Durango. Well, technically I lease a Durango. It's a 2018 Durango Citadel and its lease is over. So I'm considering possibly getting another Durango, although I'm not entirely sure yet. Be sure and stay tuned for that video coming out soon. This very red and very dirty Durango is mine, and I will let you in on a secret. Back in 2018, I leased it, I didn't buy it, and the reason for that was the Ford Explorer and the Lincoln Aviator. I knew that Ford was going to come out with that model very, very soon, and a lot of rumors were swirling that they were gonna target the Durango very directly when it came to towing ability and towing prowess, basically. That didn't end up happening. The Explorer and the Nautilus, they have relatively high tow ratings for a three-row crossover in America, but they're several thousand pounds below the top end tow rating on the Durango. And for 2021, you can tow 8,700 pounds when properly equipped with all three V8 engines, the 5.7, the 6.4, and the 6.2 liter supercharged engine. Let's get back to the star of this episode, the 2021 Durango. This model year brings us a refresh rather than a redesign of the Durango. So a lot of the substance of the Durango remains the same, but they did shuffle around some of the option packages, some of the feature sets, etc. Up front, we get a new front end look, new headlights, and a new front bumper and grille. It has this sort of frowny face design in pretty much all of the Durango models. This is not my favorite look. I preferred the grille design on the 2020 and prior Durango. But we have a lot of extra cooling going on and cooling demands for the 6.2 liter V8 engine are obviously extreme, so that is possibly why they changed some of this design around. In addition to massive air intakes down at the bottom, we also have functional hood louvers, so there's an intake right here and then two exhaust vents on each side. Now let's see how the Durango stacks up. You'll notice that this is on the long side of the three row crossover or SUV segment whatever you want to call the Durango. Dodge likes to call it an SUV, but in reality, this is one of the truest crossovers we have on sale in America, because this is actually one of the only crossovers that actually combines some truck elements, same engines, same transmissions available in the Ram 1500 lineup with more passenger car-like construction. This is a unibody vehicle, not a body on frame SUV, but it is rear wheel drive. And that's one of the reasons that this has the proportions that it has, because this hood, needed to be able to accommodate some big V8 engines. You can see that this hood is much longer than the hood you'd find in a Highlander or a Pilot. And that really is the entire difference in size between this and something like a Highlander, because on the inside, we have very Highlander and Pilot-like legroom and headroom in the second row and first row. And the third row is a little bit more generous than some of those other options, but still a little on the small side when you consider the exterior size of the Durango. This certainly is less roomy inside than something like the Telluride, but that's really the trade-off for the towing ability and the performance ability of this model. As you'd expect out of a performance SUV, we have big tires and big meaty brakes as well. These tires are 295 45R20s, and the brake rotor is 15 inches in diameter. It's a two-piece rotor, which is really a nice touch, and we have six piston Brembo brakes up front. Up front, there's not too much of a downside for having wide tires and wide wheels like this, but in the back, you will notice that it really cuts in on third row room. Yes, that is a Ram 1500 lurking in the background of this shot because it's also on the consideration list. A question I get asked frequently is, why don't you just get a pickup truck? Well, to be perfectly honest, towing with the vehicle that is the format of the Durango, a format that we used to have a wide variety of options to choose from in North America, I find just a little bit more practical. This is narrower and considerably shorter than especially the longest versions of the Ram 1500 and has tow ratings that are almost as healthy. In fact, this particular Durango has a higher payload rating and a higher tow rating than that Ram 1500 in the background. This particular model is rated to tow up to 8,700 pounds. You will get 8,700 pounds with the 5.7, optionally standard with the 6.4 and standard with the 6.2 liter engine in the Durango. That particular Ram pickup truck actually comes in around 7,800 pounds, so nearly 1,000 pounds less than this particular model. If you're wondering how that can be, be sure and check out the video on that Ram 1500. You'll find that on the channel as well. Here, we're gonna talk just about the Durango. We have big exhaust tips, just as you'd expect in an SRT model, but really not much else has changed. The rear tail lamp arrangement is essentially the same as the pre-refresh Durango. We still have incandescent backup lights right there, but we do get a slightly broader 
third stoplight for some reason. This is a powered hatch. And behind the powered hatch, we find pretty average cargo room for a three row crossover. This is right in line, honestly, with the Highlander and Pilot yet again. The rear bench, however, as we'll talk about in a bit, is a two person bench. So keep in mind that between the wheel wells, there are going to be a few wider options out there. That's because no other crossover that the Durango, especially the base Durangos compete with, can have 295 with tires on them. 255s are really wide when we're talking about a mainstream crossover, and you'll find plenty of options out there with 235 or 245 with tires on them. This one, 295s again, they're really, really wide tires. If you want to throw caution absolutely to the wind, there is this 710 horsepower supercharged engine. This is going to be available only for a limited time. The reason for that has to do with evaporative emissions legislation in the US. It is changing, and this particular emissions system in the Durango and in the Grand Cherokee Trackhawk do not meet the newer standards. The Grand Cherokee is getting a redesign very, very soon, which would have orphaned this particular engine and emissions system just in the Durango, and logically they didn't want to spend the money to keep this system up to date, so it's just going to end. The engine, however, will continue in other vehicles that will get updated emission systems, like the Ram TRX, like the Charger, the Challenger, etc., and probably a next generation of the Grand Cherokee as well. I know I'm standing right next to the absolute insanity that is this Hellcat engine, but instead of talking about this engine, I'd like to talk about the 5.7 and 6.4, the more rational options in the Durango. The 5.7 liter V8 is essentially the same engine that we find in the Ram 1500, mated to basically the same 8-speed ZF automatic transmission as well. Rear wheel drive is standard, but you have the choice of now two different all-wheel drive systems. You can get that V8 with a two-speed transfer case, a real rarity for a vehicle like this in America right now for some reason, or you can get it with essentially the same all-wheel drive system that we find on this and on the Durango 392, the 6.4 liter model. That all-wheel drive system is part of the new tow-and-go package on the 5.7 liter V8. Towing ability of a vehicle is not simply about horsepower. It's about the design of the suspension, the tire size, the braking ability of the vehicle, the transmission, the all-wheel drive system, etc. So in order to tow that higher amount, what Dodge decided to do was basically borrow all of that out of the SRT models. So if you get the tow-and-go package, we have the same tire size that we find on the SRT models. We have the same brakes up front that you find standard on the SRT models, and we get a slight tweak to the rear suspension, just like we find on SRT models. They've reinforced the attachment points for the suspension on the rear portion of the body. This is a unibody vehicle, not a body on frame vehicle. And then we get that tweaked all wheel drive system that can send power electronically front and rear as it's needed. Everything put together, the 3.6 liter V6 engine is good to tow about 6,000 pounds, the 5.7 over 7,000 pounds or 8,700 pounds if you choose that option. And then the two SRT models come in at 8,700 pounds standard. Before we move on, let's talk about towing just a little bit more. Interestingly enough, this Ram 1500 is lighter than this Durango right here. So when you have 8,700 pounds connected to the Durango because of its suspension design, its lower center of gravity, and honestly, its curb weight and its general size, it's actually pushed around a little bit less than something like a Ram 1500. And it has a whole lot more power if we're talking about the 6.4 and the 6.2 liter engine. Some truck people that I talk to say, yeah, but the rear end ratio on the Durango is 3.7 and you can get a 392 axle on the Ram 1500. That is definitely true, but we have smaller diameter wheels and tires on the Durango than we have on the Ram 1500. And that actually means an increased torque multiplication effect. So the effective ratio on this is actually higher than on that. It would be as if you had a Ram 1500 with a 405 rear end. And since towing is not simply about power figures, torque figures, suspension design, etc., it's also about braking, we actually have bigger, beefier brakes on this as well. Another common thing I hear is, well, maybe it can do that on level ground with the air conditioning off, but it certainly won't do that in the real world. Well, the Durango is tested basically on the same testing programs that they test the Ram 1500 and other pickup trucks out there. It's an SAE test procedure. Temperatures are over 100 degrees. They're going up a 12% grade. 6% is the maximum allowed on an interstate highway in the U.S., and the vehicle has to be able to do that in reverse. Believe me, when going up a 12% grade with 8,700 pounds on the back, you are definitely gonna want to be in the Durango with at least the 6.4 liter V8 engine because it has 75 pound-feet of torque approximately over that Ram 1500 with better gearing as well. 
One of the interesting things about owning a vehicle for a few years is that sometimes your opinion changes on certain things, and the seats are definitely one of those things. I wasn't the biggest fan of the Durango seats when I first bought it. The seat bottom cushion can feel a little bit firm and perhaps a little bit overstuffed, I guess you might say. It's sort of like Little Miss Muffet is sitting on a tuffet. But on longer road trips, I discovered that these seats are actually more comfortable than I thought. I recently had the opportunity to drive a Volvo XC90 for about five hours straight, and then the next day I ended up using my Durango because my legs were falling asleep in that XC90. I found the Durango seats to actually be a little bit more comfortable. They're also more adjustable than average in this segment, with four-way adjustable lumbar support, power tilt telescopic steering column as well in this particular model, and the passenger seat has the exact same range of motion as the driver's seat. Now let's check out the back seats. With the front seat comfortably adjusted for me at six feet tall, I have about five to six inches of legroom left. Again, remember that this has about the same size interior as a Highlander or a Pilot. So if you're looking for something big on the outside and big on the inside, that isn't going to be the Durango. This is going to be big on the outside and a little bit smaller on the inside. You'll also notice this doesn't have as many seats as some of the competition. The Durango is either a six or a seven seat vehicle. Most of the trims you'll find out there on dealer lots seem to be six seats. So we have captain's chairs right here in the middle, and the third row is always a two-passenger third row. The outboard seats have fold-down center armrests, and there is an available center console, but I would not get that option if I were you, because it does make getting back there into the third row a little bit more difficult, because the only way to get back there is to flip and fold the second row seats. These move in kind of an old-school way, I guess you'd say. You cannot leave a child seat latched into place or even a booster seat latched into place and still get into the third row. Now, the second row seats also do not slide forward and backward. With the flip and fold design, getting back there into the third row is pretty easy, as long as the front seat isn't all the way back in its tracks. And then let's uh, go ahead and check out the third row room here. These are pretty easy to fold back into position. We have a pretty decent amount of room, to be pretty honest. Even though these second row seats do not slide forward and backward, I have about an inch of leg room left. If I sit in what I would describe a more natural seating position, I have about an inch of headroom left. But if I try and put my head back here to the headrest, I do have to crane my head to one side in order to do that. Now again, this is a strict two seat third row, but I have to say that these seats are probably a little bit more comfortable than most of the competition. And interestingly enough, they're also slightly bucket shaped. That's obviously made possible because this is not a 60-40 seat design, but we do have slight little bolsters there for the seat bottom cushion and the seat back cushion as well. The reality, of course, is that like most people that buy a three row crossover, my third row spends most of its time folded. With the third row folded, we have seating for four or five and four or five passengers worth of luggage for sure as well. The spare tire is tucked up underneath the vehicle. This particular model does not have it. It is optional on some of the trims and it can be either a compact spare tire on the SRT model like this one or a full size spare tire depending on the version that you're looking at. Although I find it hard to remember that the button for the power hatch is over here on the side, People that are a little bit shorter than I am or families with young children that might need to be able to close the hatch will appreciate this because it is much closer to them than having the button on the top of that hatch. As we look around the interior, you might want to take note of the options that this vehicle does not have. We have the suede headliner, but we don't have a moonroof. Obviously, that is going to reduce curb weight, so keep that in mind when we start talking about 0 to 60 times. We have height adjustable shoulder belts and a slightly different headrest design. These are now a ratchet style four-way adjustable headrest. The front seats and the second row seats have the SRT Hellcat logo embroidered on them. That's a really nice touch in here. You can get a red leather option. That's certainly one that I would select if I were shopping for one of these because it does help dress up the interior. Otherwise, it's just sort of a sea of black. We have more aggressive bolstering on the front seat back and seat bottom cushions. The doors don't really change for this refresh of Durango, so really the only change going on there is the trim. This has sort of a crushed carbon fiber look going on right there. It is kind of an interesting look. It sort of uh, reminds me a little bit of either some interesting OSB oriented strand board or perhaps something like linoleum, I guess. On the driver and front passenger doors, we have slightly different door handles than we had before. And then we have the big change for 2021, a new dashboard design. This is one of the reasons that I think the Durango isn't going to go anywhere for 2022. Why give us a dashboard design for just one model year? This one has the stitched dash components. That is an option. Again, more of that trim right there. Soft touch materials. This is the same Alcatara we find on the seats. We have a 12 volt power port. It's been relocated from the center console. 
and then a very similar bin style glove compartment. I was barely able to fit a nine inch tablet computer in there. Some of the larger ones wouldn't fit. And then the big change in here is this just over 10 inch color touchscreen infotainment system. This is now running the latest version of FCA's Uconnect software. As you can see, it supports Android Auto and Apple CarPlay, but it is much higher resolution than the display that it replaces. You'll really notice that in all of the menu interfaces here, as well as interacting with that smartphone integration. The software is definitely easy to use and has a nice quick feel to it. We have redesigned air vents there, engine start stop button. If you have the trailer brake controller, it will be down here in this area. We have redesigned buttons for the climate control system. Three zone climate control is available. This particular model has it. We have physical controls for the heated and ventilated seats. There's also a launch control button right there for easy access to launch control. It's a handy touch. An SRT button brings up the SRT pages. This is now much more responsive than the previous generation of the Uconnect software. In addition to managing all the million ways that you can adjust the drivetrain, we have an auto setup here so you can choose all of those various options for those drive modes. There's also a custom drive mode, a tow mode, etc. We can also pull up performance pages. This is pretty similar to the previous generation, but as you can see, much, much faster in loading. Extra gauges, we have a built-in dyno, g-force meter, vehicle dynamics there, etc. Unfortunately, the one thing that has not improved in resolution is the backup camera. It gets basically the same backup camera that we had in the previous generation. Back down the center console, we have four USB input ports, a storage area there for your knickknacks, Qi wireless charging mat, two large cup holders there, an area where you can store other small knickknacks because we don't have the two-speed transfer case in this model. Basically the same shifter that we had before with the manual mode over there. Center armrest for the driver and front passenger. It opens to reveal a moderately sized storage compartment. It is definitely smaller than some of those front wheel drive crossovers that you might want to cross shop with other versions of the Durango. And then we have a second level of storage if you open that up that way. Surprisingly, the instrument cluster was not refreshed for 2021. So this is still the same LCD that we found in the previous generation. It changes a little bit based on whether you get the SRT model or not. We have a physical ring around it for the SRT model, and then we get a digital tachometer rather than a digital speedometer. So in the regular Durango, this would be the tachometer over here. In the SRT, it's a speedometer, and then the tachometer moves there to the middle. The SRT steering wheel is probably one of my favorites currently available. It has a flat bottom, some squared off sides, it's really thickly rimmed, and it has small paddle shifters on the back. This is one thing that some people either like or dislike is the small paddle shifter design. They're really only about that big, and that's because the buttons for the infotainment system are still on the back of the wheel. So we have track up and down on this side, volume up and down on this side. If you go around, you can see that is the entire paddle right there. This particular model does not have the optional radar adaptive cruise control. There would be buttons over here for that if it did. The controls for that multifunction LCD are on this side. Then we have some dedicated phone and voice command buttons. The only other major change on the driver's side is the relocation of the seat memory switches. They're now integrated into the new door handle design. The Durango Hellcat is quite simply the most bonkers thing you can buy in America right now. 710 horsepower packaged into an SUV that is over 200 inches long and has three rows of seats but goes zero to 60 as fast as a Dodge Viper, faster than any current Mustang on sale right now is absolutely insane. This model ran zero to 60 in 3.44 seconds. And because it has an automatic transmission and all wheel drive, it is super simple to go zero to 60 in 3.44 seconds. In fact, you don't even need to use launch control to go zero to 60 in 3.5 seconds. Launch control is fun, definitely amusing, but it does not seem essential in order to get absolutely bat crap crazy zero to 60 times in the Durango. All you need is your right foot on the accelerator pedal. And the acceleration is so drama free. You just floor it and absolutely crazy things happen. The funny thing about this all wheel drive system is that it has a strong rear power bias. So when you just romp the pedal, you actually get the rear tires to spin just a little bit. And there's probably even a tiny bit of front wheel spin going on as well. And that's why if you want to get the best zero to 60 time, it has to be on a perfectly level, perfectly dry, grippy road surface. And you're going to need the summer tires probably going to want to get them a little bit warm first as well. This is the kind of vehicle where if you take it to a drag strip, you may actually need just a little bit of prep work to get that fast zero to 60 time. And if you want the fast zero to 60 time, just take the all season tires off your shopping list. You're going to want the summer tires. If you opt for the 6.4 liter naturally aspirated V8 engine, then that zero to 60 time will drag out just a little bit to 4.7 seconds. Still very, very respectable for an over 5,000 pound SUV. 
Now let's talk about some of the numbers here. I don't have access to a skid pad, but I do have friends that do, and this pulled 0.9 Gs, according to Motor Trend, on their skid pad. That is totally believable, and it puts this within striking distance of something like a Subaru WRX. It's absolutely insane for something this big. But like they noted, there is a catch, and if you get a little too heavy on the throttle, the Durango definitely feels big and heavy. It doesn't handle poorly. This has incredibly good genes. Remember that the basis for the Durango formed back when Mercedes owned Chrysler. And this as a result has a lot of Mercedes DNA baked into the suspension design. And that is definitely a very good thing. This handles the power incredibly well, but it weighs over 5,000 pounds. And the tires, although enormous and sticky, are not as enormous as you might think for a vehicle that has 710 horsepower. When we talk about power to braking ability, the 6.4 liter V8 seems just about right. It can stop in about 110 feet or so. Stopping distance in this model was also 110 feet. This has the up-level brake package, but your brakes are gonna get a little warm if you keep doing that time after time after time because of the mass of the Durango. The Durango certainly doesn't feel like an uncontrollable brick, but this doesn't have the polish level that you'd find in a BMW X5M or a Mercedes-Benz GLE 63, something along those lines. But none of those have 710 horsepower. So that really puts the Durango in a very interesting niche uh, that is practically only occupied by other vehicles from the same manufacturer, like a Charger or a Challenger or a Grand Cherokee with a 6.2 liter supercharged engine, or I guess a pickup truck if you wanted something that has almost as much power but a bed in the back. Thanks to the adaptive suspension system that's available on all three V8 engines, interestingly enough, for 2021, rougher paved roads like this are absolutely no problem for the Durango. Clearly, if I put this in track mode, the suspension is going to get firmer, but it is still surprisingly livable. The Durango is not as harsh as some other SUVs out there, and that probably has something to do with the curb weight. Perhaps the most important thing to know about the Hellcat Durango, and this applies in really a lot of ways to the 6.4 liter Durango as well, is that the engine has so much power that it can certainly write checks that the tires on the vehicle simply can't cash. If there was some way to stuff wider tires on the Durango Hellcat, that is certainly something that I would recommend. Obviously the grippiest tires that you can find as well. This vehicle is just so impossibly fast in the quarter mile. It is about as fast as a wide variety of high level performance vehicles in the quarter mile, zero to 100 times, etc. And we're talking about, again, an over 200 inch long three row SUV. But when it comes to the corners, obviously something like the Viper or the Mustang in top level trims or the Camaro in top level trims or the Corvette, they're going to handle better than this, but they might not go as fast as this. Oh, I forgot fuel economy. Probably the least said about that, the better. I've been averaging 12.2 miles per gallon over this tank of gas. So uh, yeah, definitely not the most efficient Durango. I've said this before and I'll say it again. I love the fact that this engine exists in the Durango, not in and of itself, not because I want a Hellcat Durango. I mean, obviously I do, but in a rational world, I wouldn't. Um, but because it somehow makes the 6.4 liter V8 seem like the rational choice. And 475 horsepower in a family crossover being a rational choice is in itself something that is totally bonkers. But I think it's almost enabled by this 6.2 liter V8 engine. So, you know, when you're sitting down at family dinner and your old maiden aunt is there saying, why did you really need a 6.4 liter V8 engine in your family crossover? Do your kids really need to get to soccer practice that much faster? You can say, well, it was, it was the rational option. I wanted the towing ability and, uh, you know, I, I didn't choose the 710 horsepower option. I was being the responsible parent that I am. It's now time to end the video because there's really no direct competition for the Durango Hellcat and if you haven't already ordered one, you won't be able to buy one because Dodge has said that they're going to fulfill all the orders that were placed in the original time frame, but no additional people will be able to order themselves a Durango Hellcat. So the only way you'll be able to get your hands on one is on the used market with incredible markups. And there's really no direct competition. You could look at something like an Alpina XB7 or an Audi SQ7 or Mercedes-Benz GLS 63, but all three of those things are just not the same thing as the Durango. They won't tow as much. They're not quite as insane, quite as crazy as 
the Durango either. They're all a little bit better thought out, to be perfectly honest. Definitely more refined. And the Mercedes and the BMW especially will be considerably more expensive. That GLS 63 gets pretty darn expensive. If you want to know more about that one, there's a video on the channel. I will have a review of the SQ7 at some point soon. But if you want to get your hands on a Durango at the moment, the highest performing one you will be able to buy is the regular SRT model with a 392 engine in it for 475 horsepower. Stay tuned for a video on that one. I'll see all of you later.